Y'all with me this morning? All right, here we go. Like uh, Pastor Trey said, my name is Chad. I'm the campus pastor here. So if I haven't had the chance to meet you, I would love to meet you after service today. Get to hear your story. We've got a welcome lunch coming up today, actually after second service. And so that's maybe something you wanna check our app after I'm done preaching, of course. You probably don't wanna do it now while I'm preaching. You might miss something, but I'd love to see you at the welcome lunch if you feel like you're newish and not connected to Courageous yet. Okay, y'all good with that? All right, let's dive in. So we are kicking off a new series today called Relationship Rehab. Who thought they were gonna come to church today and me dig through their trash cans about their relationship? We're about to rehab some relationships in the house today. Y'all ready for that? All right, well, whether you are or not, we're gonna jump in, it doesn't matter. So here's the deal, Valentine's Day, it's, it's pretty fitting that we're kicking off this relationship series after Valentine's Day because Valentine's Day was this past Wednesday. And so I would be willing to bet that you fall in one of three of these Valentine's Day categories. So number one, you were either ordering in Chinese food and it was you and your tears and some crab ragoon. That's one way that some of y'all celebrated Valentine's Day. Another way, this is maybe a more traditional way that you celebrated Valentine's they may be you receive some flowers and some chocolates in the office, or you might have been the person who sent some flowers and chocolates. Where are my edible arrangement people at? It's the best of both worlds. It's a bouquet that you can eat. So good. That's a pro tip, edible arrangements. Now, the third group, I don't know what's worse, the crab rangoon and crying or this group right here, because some of y'all are wishing that somebody would have sent you a bouquet of flowers and some chocolate, and then some of you got yelled at at home for not sending a bouquet of flowers and chocolate to the office. Which group, just hold it up on your hand or you want to. No, I'm just kidding, don't really do that. I saw some ones out there. If someone else around you was holding up a one, you guys should meet. Perhaps by next Valentine's Day, Valentine's Day, y'all guys will be ready for not the crab rangoons, okay? So it doesn't really matter. I set all that up because we're about to jump into a relationship series. It doesn't really matter where you fall, like whether you were single on Valentine's Day or you were celebrating it big and having a steak and, and flowers and whatever, or whether you were disappointed, it doesn't really matter because at the end of the day, relationships need to be built on a foundation. Like usually one commercial holiday is not going to make or break a relationship. Now, if, the, if it happens every single Valentine's Day, maybe, but one Valentine's Day is probably not going to make or break your relationship. And so this is where the church comes in. Now, I don't want you to go home today and say, well, Pastor Chad, and get in an argument and get in a fight or get some tension in your relationships and say, well, Pastor Chad said well, the, church, the church is gonna help us with the relationships. Let's call him and let's fight over the phone. That's not really what I'm talking about here. I'm gonna break it down today, but that's not what I'm talking about. Y'all gotta take some action and y'all gotta have some steps in your marriage in order to work through some tensions. You can't be calling me. You can't be calling the church every time you're in some relationship tension. Yet, the church is here to help. What I'm trying to tell you is that the people that you go to small group with, the people that you serve with, the people that you might be sitting with right now are sometimes put in your life to help you. Like you come to church and sometimes God puts people in your life to help you. People that have successful relationships, people that have been through some stuff and can pour into you. And so that is where the church comes in. I remember when, uh, before Natalie and I were married, we were dating, we were engaged actually, and I was a bachelor. Um, and now as a bachelor, even today, I always have kind of taken some pride in the fact that I'm pretty clean and tidy. Like I stay pretty organized. You hop in my truck or anything, my bag, anything like that, it's gonna be nice and organized. You're gonna have no problem me saying, hey, can you go find this in my truck? I'll tell you exactly where it's at and you're gonna find it. I'm neat, I'm tidy, I'm clean, I'm organized. Even as a bachelor, all those, years ago, I, I, I lived that way. I've always lived that way. And so when Natalie and I were engaged, I actually lived by myself. I, was, I didn't have any roommates or anything like that because that would interrupt kind of that neat and tidiness. I feel like I'd be a pretty bad roommate because I'd be writing my name on stuff. I'd be, I, I don't let dishes soak. I just do the dishes, right? And so I don't know that I would have made it with a roommate. So I'm living by myself in this 999 square foot, just probably a thousand, just right under, a, just a sneeze under a thousand square foot house. And so this house that I'm living in by myself, like it's, it's a great house. It was a great first house. The laundry room was in the bathroom. And so washer and dryer in the bathroom, part of the pantry also in the bathroom. So if you're doing your laundry or going to the bathroom, you needed a snack, it's right there. It's very available, very convenient. And so 
But one of the, the, the spare bedroom rather, the doorway was like so small that I had to turn sideways to get through it and then open back up. And you know, I was a little bit better in shape at, at that point in my life. But if I went back to that old house now, I'd definitely be sucking in to try to get through that doorway. It was the craziest thing. It opened up to a real bedroom, but the doorway was so small, it was crazy. And so in the living room, I actually had a half sectional, half of a sectional, that's all I could afford. It was like the, the curved section that the two straight ends attached to, that's what I bought. I went in the store and said, I'm your guy. The other two pieces haven't come in yet, let me take that off your hands for 85 bucks because I need a couch. So I had the curved piece of a half sectional. So I'm painting the picture of my bachelor pad, but it, remember it's clean, it's tidy, it's organized. It may be a little bachelor-esque, but it's very clean, it's very tidy. And so anyway, Tuesday afternoons were cleaning day. Why Tuesday afternoon? I don't know. That's just the day I had available to clean. So every Tuesday afternoon was cleaning day. And I had a full-fledged plan on how to keep this house clean. Like, y'all, I'm like, okay, I know what to do. I'm out on my own for the first time. My mommy ain't gonna clean my room. I, it's, it's time. I'm a grown man. I'm gonna clean. And so I had in that pantry slash laundry room slash bathroom where I kept all my cleaning supplies, your boy, every Tuesday afternoon, cleaned the whole house with Febreze. Where are my Febreze people at? Anybody? Yeah, that stuff's not bad for you at all. It is not the least bit chemical and bad for you. But that's how I clean the whole house. Like literally, I would double fist some Febreze. Like I'm like John Wayne, just twisting it, shooting Febreze everywhere. It was how I cleaned the whole house. So like that half sectional, right? Okay, Febreze. That's how I cleaned it. The, the, my bed linens, my towels, Febreze. You don't wash a towel, a towel washes you, right? And so I would Febreze that thing longer to, to, to make it last longer so I didn't have to wash it because I had like one towel. So if it gets in the laundry room and then I you know, forget and I take a shower and then I don't have a towel. So it was a whole deal. So I'm Febrezing that towel. Everything was Febreze. The, the toilet, Febreze. Like I'm not cleaning the toilet, I'm Febrezing it. it it's gonna kill 99% of the bacteria. Why would I need to do anything else? I'm Febrezing everything. And you gotta be careful with Febreze because if you get Febreze too close to a surface, it's gonna leave a little mark. You gotta spray that Febreze up in the air and let that magical mist meander down on your surfaces, cleaning everything, killing 99% of bacteria. Febreze, I'm telling you, if you're not about Febreze, you need to get about it, okay? There's Dollar Generals on every corner. I'm sure you can even get Febreze at come and go. So Natalie moves in, right? We get married. She moves in. That first Tuesday, it's cleaning, it's, it's, I mean, it's five o'clock for breeze time. It is time to clean the house on a Tuesday as she's sitting on that half sectional, I'm sure, and, and I'm like cleaning the microwave with Febreze. I'm getting everything nice and tidy. She's sitting on the couch and, and I probably Febrezed right over her and she's getting Febreze dust in her mouth and she's like, what the heck are you doing? Well, I'm cleaning the house. What does it look like I'm doing? And then she proceeds to tell me that I'm not cleaning the house correctly. And I don't know if, if there are any married men in the house, but that was, our first, that was the first time I felt disrespected by my wife. Like, what do you mean? I'm trying to clean, where are my men at? I'm trying to clean the house. I've provided this castle. Well, I feel the Holy Spirit right now. I've provided the laundry room, the pantry, and the bathroom. That's three things in one. That's the same as my body wash, y'all. It is a palace. And she's like, that's not how you clean. And so husband's pro tip, um, I learned this quickly, obviously the first week of my marriage, something you shouldn't say in an argument is the phrase, submit to your husband. <laughs> Didn't go well, that's a pro tip for you. Some of y'all are shaking your heads like, yep, been there, done that. But the thing is, inevitably arguments and tension in your relationships, whether you're married or not, they're gonna come. It doesn't matter if you're married, if you're in a relationship, arguments, tensions, they're gonna come. And especially in a marriage, but in all relationships, you have to make a choice. Are you going to go to your single friends or your friends who aren't happy in their marriage and relationships and seek advice and vent to them? Because here's what's gonna happen. If you are having tension in your relationships, in your marriage, and you go to people who are also having tensions in their relationships, in their marriage or who are single because for whatever reason they haven't had a successful relationship or marriage, well then what's their advice gonna be? It's not gonna be very good. 
It may be the advice you wanna hear in the moment, but it's not gonna be very good. And so again, I'll say to you, this is where the church comes in. This is where you surround yourself with people who have relationships that are successful, who have been through some crap. Can I say crap on the stage? I did, I said it three times now, so I'm gonna probably say it one more time. But people who have been through some crap in their relationships, people who have come out the other side, who aren't perfect, who don't claim to have a perfect relationship, but are willing to pour into you, who are willing to show you and talk to you in your small group and when you're serving together about some mistakes that they have made, people that want you to succeed. And so I'll say again, this is where the church comes in to help. In the book of John, we see Jesus himself step in as a marriage counselor. So I'm going to read to you this story. It's it's a few scriptures, but it's a good story. So stay with me. All right. We're in John chapter four. We're going to start in verse five and I'll probably stop about verse 19. John chapter four, starting with verse five. This is Jesus. So he came to town to a town of Samaria called Sychar near the field that Jacob had given his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. Verse seven, a woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Verse eight, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it was that was saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Say living water. Verse 11, the woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this well to drink from from it himself as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of welling, uh, a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Verse 15, the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty and have to come here and draw water again. Jesus said to her, Here's where we talk about relationships now. Go call your husband and come here. Verse 17, the woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you are right in saying I have no husband. For you have had five husbands and the one you have now is not your husband. What you have said is true. And so Jesus is digging through her trash can a little bit. He's, he's performing some, some counseling, some relationship rehab. He's like, yeah, you don't have a husband. In fact, you've had five husbands and now you have a sixth who's not even your husband, yet you're living together and you're dysfunctional and, and you know, you're not ready, right? He's pouring into her. And this is an out of the way on purpose conversation. Jesus didn't have to go to this well. It talks about his disciples went to go get food. He could have gone with them to go get food. Instead, he went to a well. The woman of Samaria just said that it, it, that Jews and Samaritans don't really, don't really co-mingle and cohabitate. And so he kind of went out of his way to this well. And that's an important piece of this story. A lot of the miracles later um, uh, here, Jesus goes to, the, to, to a pool where there are some people who are, you know, um, um, who can't walk and things like that. And he heals people there. Uh, he also heals people with the, the fishes and the loaves. He heals the person who, who is who's brought down from the roof, right? Those people were seeking him. This lady was not seeking him. She was doing her daily routine. This was her normal habit to go draw well. Jesus went out of his way to find her and to pour into her. And I'd be willing to bet there are some people in this room who have a similar story. Jesus went out of his way. I wasn't looking for him. He went out of his way to find me. Jesus has compassion for those who are struggling. He has compassion for those who are struggling in relationships, especially broken marriages. And what's funny is Jesus is for those who throw coffee mugs across the kitchen. Jesus is for those who yell and scream and cuss when they argue. Why? Because without a renewed mindset, most of us, many of us in this room have never seen a healthy, successful example of marriage. And Jesus has compassion. 
Here's what we normally see instead, right? We all know these statistics. This is what we normally see when it comes to marriage. Over 40% of first marriages fail. Almost 50% of first marriages fail and end in divorce. And then our culture is a culture in which, you know, really persuades young people to not even get married. A lot of our younger generation aren't even thinking marriage is for them. They are thinking like, ah, oh, this is probably, this is a, a cultural construct. The government created this. That's all about taxes. And so I don't even want to get married. I don't want to be tied down, right? We've all heard that. You may be thinking that in this room today. But in fact, our initial version of marriage is usually heavily influenced by culture. But here's the thing. Culture didn't invent marriage. A lawyer didn't invent marriage. Legislation didn't invent marriage. Marriage is a God-ordained institution, a covenant entered into with our heavenly father. Marriage was created by God, not a lawyer, not the government, that's why we encourage couples in the church when they get engaged to go through pre-marriage counseling right here at the church. But still, only God can make it work. We find this in, in, in back in verse 13 through 14. I'm gonna read to you again. This is John verses 14, uh, 13 and 14 rather. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks the water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty forever. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up for eternal life. You go to those friends, you have an argument, you go to your friends and they give you advice and then you're thirsty again. You have another argument. You, you, you are contemplating whether this is working. You're deciding whether you wanna exit, whether you wanna leave because you're thirsty. You're going to a well that doesn't produce an eternal uh, uh, spring of water. But when you go to Jesus, it's a spring of living water within you. Now, here's the thing. We all know those couples Right, We all know those couples, and if you don't know one of those couples, you are one of these couples. Who That couple, the cutesy couple that have pet names, oh, honey, honey boo boo, and little, little, little Debbie, or whatever you call each other out there, and that's probably not an appropriate name. That was a test, and I'm not calling my wife little Debbie, I can tell you that. But we all know those couples who say, I love you more, no, I love you more, no, I love you more, no, you hang up, no, you hang up first, no, you hang up first, right? Anybody know those couples? If you don't know that couple, you are that couple, and here's the thing, knock it off, because it's, it's, it's not cute. It, there's a honeymoon phase, and I get that, but when it comes to that type of couple, I just wanna gag, because at some point, that enters into an overly dependent, dysfunctional relationship based on approval. It gets old, it gets exhausting. If I always, if I set the precedent where I always have to tell my wife, no, you hang up first, no, you hang up first. No, I, I mean, she can barely say goodbye sometimes before I'm hanging up. Like, I got stuff to do. And so I, I think it becomes dysfunctional. It becomes based on approval. It's severe and clingy dependency issues. And so if you want a marriage where your spouse can't take their hands off of you, you gotta be confident, you gotta have some swagger about you. You gotta be confident in your relationship. But more than that, you have to be confident that Jesus is your source. Jesus heals my heart. If I want a great relationship with my wife, I have to be confident that Jesus is my source, that he heals my heart, that he meets my needs. If Natalie walks out the door tomorrow, I don't know if she's here. Please, if you're here, Natalie, please don't walk out the door tomorrow. Uh, but if she does walk out the door tomorrow, it would suck. It'd be horrible. I'd be lonely, but I still have King Jesus with me. Nobody can take that away. We just did communion. Nobody can take away what Jesus has done for me. Some of y'all watched that Super Bowl halftime show last Sunday and you're just, you wanna find someone who you can slow dance with in front of everybody and call your boo so people can hear you. It's more about having a relationship than having a healthy relationship. But you know, Usher and Alicia Keys, they're not married, they're not even dating. In fact, they're married to other people, which is gross when you think about the Super Bowl halftime performance. They're faking it. It was a performance. All of this, I can't live out, I can't live without my boo stuff. It, it's, it's desperate, it's dependent, it's dysfunctional. And I'm not calling anybody out today, I'm trying to help you. I can live without you, I don't want to. I don't wanna live without Natalie. I would never wish that, I never want that. It would really, really suck. But if I had to, I could do it. But I can't live without Jesus. And Jesus doesn't, Jesus wants you to be booed up. So if you're single or if you're struggling with relationships, okay, Jesus wants you to be booed up. He wants you to be in a happy, successful relationship. But what he doesn't want is for you to do it 
without him. He wants to be first in your relationships. Relationships go sideways when we look to someone else to fulfill our deepest needs. If I'm putting my deepest needs onto Natalie, I'm setting her up for failure. I'm setting me up for failure because she can't fulfill them because my source is Jesus Christ. And so as a living, breathing human, we have four basic needs, four basic needs. Here's number one. Our first basic need is acceptance. Say acceptance. Acceptance is our first basic need as a human. Your spouse is not automatically set up to love you unconditionally. Does anybody feel that today? Your spouse is, they're not designed to love you unconditionally, right? That's God. God loves us unconditionally. Most people's love is based on what they don't know about us. Natalie did not know that I snored before we got married. Now that I bring snoring into the table, she's like, oh, I, I still love you, but wow, I didn't know that I was signing up for that. She didn't know some of the things that she was signing up for because love is, is, is not automatically unconditional by our spouse or by the person we're in a relationship with. with. People are conditional and unreliable, but in the eyes of Christ, you are loved and accepted for who you are, right? Romans chapter eight, thir verse 35 and 37. We'll start with verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Does this sound familiar? This is what we read together during communion. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. We need acceptance, and it comes from our Father, not somebody else. Number two, this is our number two basic need for a human being is identity. Say identity. We need a, a source of identity. We need to have an identity as an individual, as a human being. And so you have to like you first. You have to like you before anybody else can love you, okay? Why? Because I'm not always gonna like you. Like if you don't like yourself sometimes and then I don't like you sometimes because you snore or you, you know, you, the, your style or your haircut or whatever else, you, the way you chew your food, how am I supposed to like you all the time if you don't even like you all the time? David said in Psalm 139, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. God has so many thoughts about you. There are too many to document. And we don't find our identity in a job, in a title, in a career, in another person. We find our, our identity in Jesus Christ. Here's our third one, security. One of our biggest needs as a human is to feel secure. And now when I say security, I'm not talking like Atlas or, or whatever else, like I got an alarm system on my house. I'm talking about a safety, feeling a, a sense of safety from life's craziness. Your spouse at one point or another might lose their job. They might be the breadwinner and they lose, your, lose their job. Where's your sense of security come from? Maybe they don't lose their job, but instead their passions, their skills, their giftings lead them to a job that provides, but maybe it doesn't provide the fancier and the finer things in life. Maybe you're a caviar fan and your breadwinner at home is not providing that, but they still provide a great life for you. They still pay the bills. They still put food on the table. They still take care of the family. They still lead. Where does your security come from? Will you trust in God? I am safe and secure from harm in Christ Jesus. Psalm 91, this is David again. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Money and muscles can't make you secure. They might be nice, but people can't, can't give you security your trust in God, your dependence in him is when he becomes your refuge and your fortress. This is our last one here before I wrap up. Purpose. One of our most basic needs as a human being is purpose. Natalie can't define my purpose for me. My wife, my relationships cannot define my purpose. My career is not my purpose. I find purpose in God and serving in his kingdom. I never would have chosen this. This is never a life serving God, being up here in front of you preaching. 
I never would have chosen this for myself. I was pretty happy smoking pot and partying with my friends on a Friday night. I was good with that. Little Taco Bell, little, I'm not gonna name any names of any people or any substances, but I was pretty good with that. That was fine. I was happy living that life. I think I could have continued that for a long time. But the problem is, is that when Jesus started doing a work in my life, everything changed and I can't go back. I can't go back to that. It doesn't appeal to me. It doesn't make me happy. I thought I drew purpose from that and enjoyment and I don't want that anymore because I found something bigger than anything I'd ever experienced before and that's Christ Jesus. And so you may be asking yourself, how do I identify my purpose? That sounds good. I'm tired of smoking pot. I'm tired of partying. I'm tired of relationships failing. I'm tired of doing the same thing over and over. Yeah, it worked for you, but I'm waiting on God to do that for me. Well, sometimes we need to take a step ourselves. So here's how you find, uh, here's how you identify your purpose. The first thing you have to do is identify what you're good at. Identify what you're good at. Are you good at working with your hands? Are you good at talking to people? Are you good at hospitality? Are you good at behind the scenes stuff? Do you have a, a gift in technology? Do you have an ear for music? What are you good at? After you define what you're good at, you then need to identify how you can use it to honor God. Oh, guess what? Welcome to the Courageous Church where we have open opportunities for people to get involved and serve. And so if you're sitting on the sidelines like, man, I don't have a purpose. I, don't, I need a purpose. That sounds great, but I don't have a purpose. Identify what you're good at and then come talk to me about how we can get you plugged in. If you're good at, with your hands, we got tons of stuff for you to do. If you're good behind the scenes and, and, and you've got ability with technology, we have a whole production booth back there that's probably getting ready to make the lights flicker because they're excited to have you. If you're good at music, if you're good at talking to people, we have a welcome team. We have ample opportunities. Once you identify what you're good at, identify how you can use it to honor God. And then after that, the last thing you have to do is to decide that you will cancel comparisons. The first time I got up to preach in front of y'all here at South on a Sunday, you know, I'm not Pastor Tyler. Pastor Tyler's been doing it for what, 57 years, something close, 57 and a half. Probably just got fired after that. Um, I'm not Pastor Tyler, I'm not Pastor Brandon, I'm not anybody, I'm just me and I have to accept that, okay? I wanna strive to be better, but I'm not gonna compare myself. I'm not gonna compare where I'm at and my walk with God and what he's doing in my life to somebody who's been doing it for 30 years or 57 and a half years or 10 years or whatever that might be. You have to kill comparison. Now I wanna caution you here, if we don't trust Jesus with our deepest needs, we will automatically transfer that on to the people we're closest to. If you don't trust Jesus with your deepest needs, with those four things, you're gonna transfer them to the people you're closest to, to the people you're in relationship with, to your wife, to, to your spouse, whoever it might be. But God made you to depend on him. So as much as I love my wife, as she knows I love her, she needs to know that God loves her more. As much as Natalie loves me, and let's face it, I mean, she loves me a lot. Like, who wouldn't? Can you? We've been married for 10, almost 10 years. That's crazy. We've been married for almost a decade. And, and I know she loves me, but I know God loves me more. And so because of that, I trust him. I don't trust my spouse more than I trust Jesus. Now, she's number two, but I trust Jesus the most. When I don't trust God, I begin to transfer that trust onto someone else. And so if, you, if, if, if I put it on Natalie or if I don't put it on Natalie, then I put it on our kids or I put it on our friends and those people can't handle it. They cannot provide for me. Only Jesus can provide for me. When I depend on Natalie for acceptance and, and, and identity, stability, purpose, security, our relationship stinks. That's oftentimes when I realize I'm out of step and I'm out of tune with God when our relationship starts to suck because I realize, oh crap, I'm putting all these things on you that I need to be given to God. For many of us in here, there are people in your life that you are fighting with, that you're, you're at odds with, and it's not their fault. In fact, it's your fault because you're expecting from them something from them that they're not willing or even able to give. And so when your heart is not rooted in Jesus first, you're a walking dysfunctional relationship waiting to happen. You're gonna take those needs, you're gonna turn them to another man or a woman or a pastor or a church leader or any, a business leader and they're gonna let you down. 
I feel sorry for that lady at the well because that was her sixth man. She was turning all of her needs to the opposite sex. And when you do that, it's gonna mess you up. So I'm closing with this. Here's the good news, right? Satan's ultimate goal is to destroy the idea and the sanctity of marriage. He wants to keep us separate and unfulfilled. The first trick of the enemy was not the forbidden fruit. Like that was not his first trick. The first trick of the enemy and the strategic chess move with the ultimate plan to destroy humanity was to destroy the covenant between man, woman, and God. In creation, the first thing that God said was not good, the first thing that God said, this is not good, wasn't the forbidden fruit, but it was man being alone. Genesis chapter two, verse 18, this is God saying, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper. So if your relationship sucks, if it's dysfunctional, if things aren't going well, it's God designed for you to have a helper, not a hindrance, not somebody that's a pain in your side, not somebody that you don't like, but a helper. The rate of divorce in America is close to 50%. And the amount of adults married before the age of 25 has dropped. In the 80s, uh, in 1980, it was 70% of people were married before the age of 25, and now today it's down to 22%. And listen, this, uh, this whole cohabitation thing is not a win, guys. Cohabitation is not the win. There's a difference between courting and cohabitating. Cohabitation usually stems from convenience and fear. We're not gonna get married, but we're gonna cohabitate because it's convenient. It's convenient. Um, uh, my, my apartment lease is up, so we're gonna move in together. Or, oh, I've got a house, so we're gonna move in together. That's convenient, and it may be based out of fear. Cohabitating usually happens to avoid problems that you've seen other people deal with or experiences you've had previously. So this is where the woman at the well was. She's cohabitating at this point with another man. Jesus says, the man you have now is not your husband because all it does is is it exaggerates the problem. Because when tension comes, and it will come, there's no commitment, there's no accountability. I can leave, I can exit at any time because I'm not accountable, there's no commitment here. But marriage is a commitment to God, not a contract with a wife or a husband. I don't care what the government says, I don't care what, what happens with your taxes, marriage is a covenant with God. Marriage is the only relationship that provides stability and intimacy that men and women need. And so the only way to get your heart fixed is to do it God's way. And so I've given you a lot of things to think about today. I know I've left you probably digging through your trash can and thinking about, well, man, my relationship sucks. Thank you for telling me things that I'm doing bad, but, but, but where's the light at the end of the tunnel? The only way to get your heart fixed is to do it God's way. It's to put Jesus first and to commit to a Jesus first lifestyle. So many of us, it starts right here with repentance. If you're struggling with marriage, if you're struggling with relationships, it starts by looking inward and saying, God, please forgive me. Forgive me for my short temper. Forgive forgive me for these tensions that I bring into relationships because I'm putting them on my significant other and not giving them to you. Retracing your steps and seeing where you're counting on someone else other than Jesus for acceptance, identity, security, and purpose is the first step. Because marriage is not a good idea or a bad idea, but it's God's idea. So this is what I can assure you. Jesus' desire is for you to meet the right person, to give you living water, to supply every need in the depth of your heart. And when that Samaritan woman fully surrendered her heart to Jesus, that's when she found her purpose. So when we left off in that story, Jesus had just dug through her trash can, but look what happens. Because she felt accepted, secure, and had her identity re- renewed, it says, it goes on to say in John chapter four that she felt so loved and empowered that she became an evangelist and couldn't stop telling her story to people about Jesus. John chapter four, we're picking up the story in verse 28. So the woman left her water jar and went away into the town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? 
Verse 39, many Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. Because she was renewed, she was screwed up. Her relationships were horrible. Her life, she was in a rut. She was doing all these daily things and on her sixth marriage and all this stuff. But because her mind was restored and she gave it all to Jesus and found her purpose and identity. It says in verse 39, many Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them and he stayed with them two days and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe for we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is indeed the savior of the world. That Samaritan woman went to the well, did her daily routine, what she does every day, not expecting to be healed and to be renewed. And she left that day renewed in Jesus Christ. Her past was healed through vulnerability, not with a man, not with the opposite sex, not in a relationship, but in Jesus Christ. And until your past is healed, it's still controlling your present and it's limiting your future. Jesus lovingly changed the Samaritan woman's heart at the well that day. And the same is said for you right now. I believe he's making a call in this place today to personally reveal to you where things have gotten out of order. He's calling you out of sin and selfishness and, and shame. And so many of you wrote off this sermon when I started because you thought it was about marriage. Maybe you're not married. Maybe you're not even in a relationship. But from today, your life will never be the same. Because once you let Jesus completely fill the depths of your heart with living water, everything else doesn't necessarily fix itself, but it becomes much easier, much lighter when you do it with Jesus. And so here's what I wanna do. No matter what stage of relationship you're in, whether you married, maybe you have a successful marriage, maybe you have a marriage that's broken, maybe you have a marriage that's not doing so well, maybe you're in a relationship and, and your relationship is in a rut, maybe you're not even in a relationship and you can't understand why. Why hasn't God sent that person to me yet? Wherever you're at over the next few moments, I just want you to pray to God and ask him, God, what is it that I'm not giving to you? If you're in a successful marriage and you feel like you've got all that stuff taken care of, you need to pray and ask God, God, put the people in my life, reveal to me who I need to help, reveal to me who I need to be in their lives in a small group and serving with so that I can help them through this. I want you to reveal, I want, I want you to pray and ask God to reveal to you what it is, identity, purpose, security, stability, that you've been putting on somebody else, you've been putting on your relationship and it's time to give it to God.